almost six years between 2016 and 2022, I owned a Zero DSR electric motorcycle. Despite early issues with the first one I owned and a failed onboard charger on its replacement, I had a smooth and happy time of ownership. My only ongoing costs were tyres and standard minimal servicing costs. By the time I came to sell it in April of 2022, I had done 21,000 miles or just under 34,000 kilometres on the bike. I loved the bike, but was really keeping an eye out for an electric motorcycle which would allow me to do longer touring rides, involving multiple charges in the shortest time, and this meant a bike which had DC charging. After a mainly successful 1,000 mile trip on a borrowed Energica Everibele towards the end of 2021, I settled on that particular bike and ordered one, receiving it in April of 2022. However, I have continued to keep an eye on developments with Zero Motorcycles, as I think they deserve credit for having done a great job in putting electric motorcycles into the hands of riders, and I think any electric motorcycle manufacturers who offer practical and commercially available, as opposed to ridiculous concept or vaporware vehicles, deserve support. In that sense, I'm pretty brand agnostic. A few weeks before I made this video, I was asked if I was interested in travelling to Belgium to ride the Zero DSRX, Zero's first true foray into the world of electric adventure biking. The trip would involve flying out to Belgium, staying overnight, and then a full day at the motor park in Olmen, not far from the Dutch border, with some mixed on and off-road riding. Suffice it to say, my arm didn't require too much twisting. This would be an opportunity to ride the Child of DSR bike, the bigger, chunkier and heavier version of my faithful DSR on Zero's Generation 3 or more accurately FST platform, including the Cypher 3 firmware. Now I have to be slightly careful here because as Zero's marketing manager for the UK and Benelux, Case Lengers went to great lengths to clarify, although the DSR-X shares the same underlying motor technology as the two predecessors in the FST range, the Z-Force 7510 passively air-cooled permanent magnet AC motor, the bike has undergone many changes in terms of where components are positioned, swing arm design and the bike's frame. This isn't simply an SRF or SRS with bigger suspension. There have been several changes made to enable the bike's use in the adventure market. And, as Case explained, the adventure market still dominates the motorcycle market in terms of bikes sold. According to Statista.com, in the UK market only naked bikes sell more. So it was a good market for Zero to pursue with an adventure model on the FST platform. The peak torque moves from 140 foot pounds or 190 newton meters on its FST siblings to 166 foot pounds or 225 newton meters on the DSRX, which surpasses the 159 foot pounds or 215 newton meters on my Energica Eva Ribelle, and makes the DSRX apparently the most torquey commercially available electric motorcycle. The DSRX has been in the pipeline since 2015 but its launch finally arrived in September 2021 with a press launch in Sicily. Now, I'll talk a little more about our day in Belgium before I run through some more information on the bike. There were actually supposed to be four of us visiting from the UK, but in the event only two of us managed to make it. Courtney, who goes by the name of Courtney Scarlett on Instagram and I, were met on the previous evening by Matt and were put up in a hotel in Lommel. The following morning, we made the short 30-minute journey to the motor park in Barlen. We were joined by another Belgian rider, Cameron, and met with Thierry Sarrasin of Adventure Academy and photographer-videographer Thierry Drico, who would be taking some of the stills and off-bike footage included in this video. The morning started with an overview of the DSRX in the form of a presentation by Case. From there, Thierry walked us through the essential controls on the bike, most of which were familiar to me. Of particular note, however, was the reverse mode, which was a little more fiddly to engage than it is on my Energica Eva Ribelle, but is nevertheless at least available, and in my own experience can prove to be extremely useful. From there, we were given a DSRX each and started initially riding some circuits on the park grass and sand field at the front of the motor park. This was just to establish that we were comfortable riding in the off-road stood-up position and with basic handling of the bike on the quite sandy surface. 
Courtney and I had no off-road experience. Well, I say I have no off-road experience. What I should say is I have no intentional off-road experience. I have been caught out on some interesting tracks in the past and had no option but to continue down them. But I mean to say I've never done any off-road training. So this was helpful grounding in riding adventure style. Stood up with your weight slightly back and relaxed arms to let the front wheel lift over the sand rather than sink in and throw you off balance. The benefit of speed on sand also made sense. You don't want to slow down and sink. Speed is your friend. The other aspect of off-road riding, which was different to on-road, was the emphasis on use of the back brake. Now, back brake is fundamental to slow riding on a road, but we take the main speed off using the front brake on tarmac. Whereas on sand, you want to avoid use of the front brake because, as Thierry pointed out, this transfers the weight of the bike forward onto the front wheel and digs it into the sand, making it more likely that you unbalance the bike and come off. We did some more practice riding the bikes through cones and doing some hard braking using the back brake, then combined braking, then riding over railway sleepers and just becoming more comfortable with the idea of the bike slipping around underneath us but having faith that it would right itself. To this end, the bike has some innovative tech from Bosch in the Bosch Motorcycle Stability Control or MSC. MSC is Bosch's attempt to take on the tyre grip trade-off. Simply put, there is a demand on a tyre which means that the harder you brake or accelerate, the less grip is available for steering, and vice versa. In advanced motorcycling, we aim to have the speed set correctly on entry into a bend so that a positive throttle can be maintained and thereby the tyre is held onto the road surface, providing constant, decent grip. But not everyone is familiar with this, and even if they are, they don't always get it right. If braking or accelerating does happen in a bend, Modern ABS and traction control try to come to our assistance, but these don't take into account a bike's lean or pitch, nose down when braking or up when accelerating. This is where Bosch's MSC comes in, which factors in the lean and pitch angles and adjusts the anti-lock function dynamically, helping to ensure that we're less likely to have the back wheel slide out from under us, have the front wheel lift off under sudden acceleration, or the back wheels lock up under braking. The system only allows the amount of braking the tyres can give under specific circumstances, providing a rider with more grip to complete their turn. MSC has been around for a few years and isn't exclusive to Zero, but it's a great addition into a bike like the Zero DSRX and adds a great deal of reassurance, even to an off-road amateur like me. I could feel the system working in sections of the off-road riding we did, notably on the sand. It didn't take long to adapt my riding style to the different surface, and we did some more riding around the complex, going on a little tour around the site, through fields, sand and woodland trails. At one point we rode around a standard oval track designed for horses to run on. It was full on sand, and so it was a case of finding the firmer sand, keeping weight back and using speed to keep going. We also took the bikes through a hollow, noting how to lean back going in and forward coming out. The bike didn't skip a heartbeat and coped admirably with all this terrain. So, having been satisfied that we all had pretty decent control of the bike, we headed for a spot of lunch before heading out for the afternoon into the surrounding countryside for a bit of riding on roads, green lanes, gravel tracks, sandy tracks and even alongside a railway at one point. So. Here's some of the footage of that afternoon's ride while I run through some more of the DSR specifications. The bike weighs in at 247 kilograms, or 544 pounds, has a peak top speed of 112 miles per hour, or 180 kilometers per hour, with a sustained top speed of 100 miles per hour, that's 161 kilometers per hour, and a carrying capacity of 250 kilograms or 556 pounds, so is capable of carrying quite a load. Peak power is 100 horsepower, that's 75 kilowatts, and continuous power measured over 30 minutes is 48 horsepower, or 36 kilowatts. The difference here will depend on environmental factors and operating temperature of the bike. The controller is a 900 amp three phase AC controller, and like any electric vehicle, the bike benefits from regenerative braking, so energy is recovered back into the battery under motor braking. 
which can be set to the rider's preferred level or governed by one of the preset riding modes. And those preset riding modes are Standard, Sport, Eco, Rain and Canyon. In addition to the riding modes, the traction control and ABS can be set separately too and turned off entirely. For the duration of the off-road riding sections of our day's ride, I put the bike into canyon riding mode with both ABS and traction control in off-road mode. I didn't pair the bike up with the Zero app on my phone, but a great feature on Zero bikes is the ability to really customise ride settings, from maximum power to detailed setting of regenerative braking. One of the great aspects I liked about my Zero DSR was the ability to configure motor regenerative braking and active regenerative braking separately. I typically set motor regenerative braking, that is when you roll off the throttle, quite light, but active regenerative braking via the front brake lever before the physical brakes kick in, quite heavy. Zero retained their belt drive for the DSRX, but in this case it's a wider and supposedly two and a half times stronger belt than on its sibling the SRS. And given that the DSRX is designed to go off-road and stones can damage a belt, there are two measures to combat this risk, aside from the belt itself being stronger. Firstly, there is a metal belt guard installed around the belt, and then the bottom section of this has holes to allow any small stones which should make it through to fall out. Seat height on the DSRX is 828mm or 32.6 inches and this posed no problem for me in keeping both my feet down when necessary. As with similarly styled bikes, it's not just the seat height but seat shape or width which can make a difference here. My Zero DSR had a higher seat than my Energica Evaribele has but I could pretty much flat foot the DSR whereas I'm a little more on my toes on the Rebele. Spanish company J. Juan still provide the brakes for this Zero model with twin discs and four piston calipers on the front and a single disc with floating caliper on the rear. Suspension is by Showa on front and rear as with its siblings in the range with 47mm cartridge forks on the front and 46mm piston piggyback reservoir shock on the rear. Both front and rear have adjustable spring, preload, compression and rebound damping. And because this is an adventure bike, the front and rear suspension travel are both 190mm or 7.48 inches. The screen can be easily raised and lowered while riding with a simple twist of one of the knobs on either side of the screen. Storage on board includes the lockable tank storage compartment, which is pretty spacious and I found quite helpful on our day's ride for stashing things away. Inside the storage compartment are two USB sockets but these are rather strangely placed around halfway down on the back side of the compartment rather than near the top or bottom. In any event I found these both useful, charging my phone with one and powering my onboard camera mounted to the handlebars with the other. And yes, the USB cable does fit nicely under the closed lid of the storage compartment. Immediately in front of the storage compartment is a separate lid to the charge port, which in Europe is the standard EV AC Type 2 Menekes socket. Having initially offered Jivy luggage on its older range of bikes and then moved to Shad for the SRF and SRS, luggage for the DSRX is available in the form of the SW Motec Trax ADV top aluminium case offering 38 litres of storage and the Trax ADV side cases. So they're decent quality and rugged cases though it's not clear which of the SW Motec sizes the panniers are from the specs and there weren't any I could take a look at. I would guess that they're the 37 litre medium ones though by the look of them. The stock tyres included on the bike are Pirelli Scorpion Trail 2 tyres, which are designed to combine road riding with a bit of light off-road riding. We actually rode on these all day with no problems, but if you need to tackle more serious adventure riding, you can get the homologated and more knobbly Pirelli Scorpion Rally tyres as an optional extra. Moving to the battery, the standard pack is the Z-Force lithium-ion 17.3 kWh battery with a usable 15.2 kWh. This capacity can be increased, but we'll come on to that shortly. The charging options have been simplified on the DSRX. Gone are the options of 3, 6, 9 or 12 kW charging, which were available when I rode the Zero SRF and SRS shortly after their prospective launches, and 
depending on configuration of bike and optional charge tank, Zero have moved to a simple choice. The bike comes with 6.6 kW onboard AC charging. This is the standard high speed single phase domestic AC charging speed across all EVs charging on dedicated domestic AC charge units and commonly installed AC charge points in destination charging locations, i.e. places where vehicles tend to spend a longer period of time such as in car parks or at workplaces. An optional additional 6 kW charge tank can be installed. Zero are calling this a rapid charger, which is an unfortunate use of the term rapid since rapid charging in an EV context typically refers to 43 kilowatts in AC terms and anything over 50 kilowatts in DC terms. So I'm going to continue to refer to it as the charge tank for consistency and to avoid any misunderstandings. The optional charge tank adds 6 kilowatts to the existing 6.6 .6 kilowatt onboard charger taking it up to a combined total of 12.6 kilowatts of charging. To put this into time terms, the claimed charge time for the standard bike without charge tank is 2 hours to 95%. The charge tank, which costs just under £2,500, halves this time, meaning the bike should charge to 95% in one hour if the bike is charged at an AC charge point capable of delivering 12.6 kilowatts. As with previous models, you can add either this charge tank to increase charging speed or a power tank to increase the bike's range. In the case of the DSRX, the power tank adds an additional 3.6 kilowatt hours of battery capacity, taking the total capacity up to 21 kilowatt hours. At the time of creating this video, the charge tank is supposedly not available until winter of 2022 and the power tank is not expected to be available until spring of 2023. Again, as with previous models, both the charge tank and power tank are placed in the rather capacious tank storage compartment, so that space is lost, though supposedly there is still a small amount of room left in the area for storage of small items, and both are mutually exclusive. You can have faster charging or a bit more range, but not both. Don't be greedy. I do also wonder what happens to the USB sockets in the tank storage compartment which must surely be lost when the charge tank or power tank are installed. I neglected to ask this so I guess we'll have to wait to find out. Now it's important to understand that with electric vehicles the rate of charging is always determined by the slowest link in the chain, the vehicle or the charge point. If you plugged an EV with a 3 kilowatt onboard charger into a unit capable of delivering 43 kilowatts the bike will not blow up, it will simply take the maximum it can from the point, which is determined in this case by the slower charger on the bike, so 3 kilowatts. Similarly, if you were to plug a DC charging EV capable of charging at 250 kilowatts into a DC charge point only capable of delivering 22 kilowatts, the vehicle will only charge at a maximum of 22 kilowatts. Bearing this in mind, to truly benefit from the charging speeds available on the DSR with the charge tank, you're going to have to find an AC charge point capable of delivering 12 kilowatts AC or above. Now these are not as common as the 6 kilowatt typical destination chargers, but they are still nevertheless dotted around. AC charge points are most commonly 6 kilowatts, but you can find 11 kilowatts, 22 kilowatts and 43 kilowatt AC points around. The 43 kilowatt points are generally installed on the DC rapid charging points, though some networks don't bother to install AC on their rapid units anymore because the de facto emerged standard for true rapid charging is DC. The good news is that where you do find an AC point on a rapid unit, it can be used while the DC cable is in use by another vehicle. And since DC is by far the most common rapid charge method in modern EVs, this does mean the Zero bikes have the advantage of being less likely to encounter a unit blocked by another vehicle using it. The most common exception here would be the older model Renault Zoe's, which used 43 kilowatts AC rapid charging. But as I just stated, AC charging on rapid chargers is likely to become less common in the UK and in the rest of Europe. Many newer rapid chargers are installed and set up just to charge two DC charging vehicles using CCS, which has become the dominant DC standard across Europe. There's no getting away from a simple fact. I know two other Energica owners who were both fellow Zero owners. 
we've all now moved to Energica bikes and it's quite simply because our requests years ago for Zero to adopt DC rapid charging fell on deaf ears. But it's not just the three of us. I've encountered multiple others online who've made the same journey. Now, Zero will put up a good defence of AC charging and there are indeed places where it's more advantageous to have AC charging. AC charging points are more common, they will say, and this is certainly true. But they are also considerably slower in most cases and too slow for longer touring purposes. There are thousands more domestic sockets too, but there are much faster charging options than domestic sockets. That said, I agree that an AC charging zero will suit the needs of most people's riding, based on statistics of how far people typically ride. And from one thorny issue to another thorny issue, the issue of Cypher Store upgrades. Well, essentially unlockable upgrades through the Cypher Store have gone on the DSRX. I know this is a divisive issue and some people may appreciate the convenience of being able to unlock features which already exist on their bike by pressing a couple of buttons and paying a couple of hundred or several hundred pounds to unlock these features without needing to visit a dealer and having any new components or hardware added. But frankly, and I'm not going to mince my words here, I thought it was a terrible model. Zero already made the outlay to include these things on the bike when they assembled the bike. Either they made a loss selling the bike to customers who won't pay to unlock these features, which wouldn't be sound business practice, or they thought they'd cream some extra money off the people who were good enough to buy their bikes. Neither of these is a good thing. Why would you not just make the bike better by including all the things you already spent the money on and thereby increase its attractiveness to potential owners? Electric motorcycles are already comparatively expensive and a small market. By running this Cypher store setup to unlock features, they probably alienated a lot of potential customers, and that's not something a company should be looking to do. What? You're going to make me pay to have the extra battery capacity and carry it around, but then lock it off to me? Erm, um, no. This just made competitors even more attractive. Anyway, the good news is that fortunately Zero have seen the light on all this, obviously saw the widespread negative reaction, realised the error of their ways, and they now just sell the bike with all the features included. Of course, they have correspondingly bumped up the price a bit, but this is still preferable to my mind. Just let me have what I paid for, right? I've covered some of the main options available, but there are a range of extras you can add in various categories through the Bike Build Configurator on the Zero website. From an adventure chain kit to replace the belt, to a centre stand, to wire wheels, in addition to a range of other extras to tart up your bike. Now if you were to tart up your bike with all the optional extras, though choosing a charge tank rather than a power tank, remember they are mutually exclusive, you'd be looking at a cool £33,141 to buy the bike. But the likelihood is you're not going to be doing that. It would be silly. If I were seriously considering the bike for me, I would almost certainly go for the charge tank, which takes the base model price of £24,150 up to £26,609, because it's far more important for me to charge faster than to travel a little bit further. Then I would probably add the luggage, which once again pushes the price up to £28,267, though I might forgo the panniers and opt for soft luggage alternatives, saving £849 in the process. Finally, I think a centre stand is a very sensible thing to have, so that would bump up my own total to £28,487. There's no getting away from it. That's a hell of a lot of money for a motorbike, and you're either going to be one of us mad EV early adopters, have lots of spare wonga, ride a lot of miles, or just prefer the experience of riding electric to justify that financially, even factoring in savings in fuel and servicing. For this kind of money, you'd be looking at a fully kitted out BMW GS with bells and whistles, or a cheaper alternative electric motorcycle, perhaps one with DC rapid charging built in. Um, I've said too much. The bike comes with an EVSE cable. That's a standard Type 2 cable for use in standard AC EV charging points to you and me. But if you want to have a UK wall outlet adapter, or a granny cable as it's known in EV circles, 
That is to say, a cable which allows you to plug the bike into a standard UK Type G domestic wall socket. You're looking at a somewhat crazy price of £445. Now, I'm not making any official recommendations here, but if it were me, I would be swerving the official Zero Granny cable and nipping down to your local screw fix or tool station and picking up one of their splendid aftermarket granny leads for under half the price. Zero might advise against this, but it is the vehicle, or more precisely the battery management system, which determines how much power to draw from a supply, and with a granny cable you're looking at a lower rate than you'd get from a dedicated EV charge point anyway. Domestic EV chargers will generally operate at up to around 7 kilowatts, but with a standard UK 240 volt socket and a 15 amp fused plug, you're looking at a maximum 3.6 kilowatt charge rate. The reality is, if you are going to be using the bike a lot, you should look at installing a dedicated domestic charge point anyway, which is a safer way to charge and offers all kinds of other advantages, such as connection with energy monitoring, so your EV can charge on cheap rate electricity, or even exclusively solar if you have it fitted. My own recommendation would be the rather splendid, British designed and manufactured My Energy Zappi. Not just because I'm doing my bit for domestic industry, but because it's a seriously good bit of kit. Anyway, let's get back to the bike and talk a little bit about the kind of rider suited to the DSRX. Firstly, if I were considering doing any serious off-road electric motorcycling, the DSRX would be my go-to bike. If that's the nature of your riding and touring is not your primary interest, there isn't an electric motorcycle to touch the Zero DSRX. It demonstrated quite clearly to me that it could hold its own on different surfaces and when you consider that none of us three guests on our day's ride even dropped the bike once, that's quite a tribute. Throughout the whole day's riding I used a mere 32% of the battery's capacity and checking the ride leader's Thierry's bike gave the same result. The need for speed when it comes to charging didn't even enter into it and we really were in the saddle for most of the day bar a lunch and afternoon cafe stop. I did do a reasonable amount of road riding and some at higher speeds too. In the absence of a competitor electric adventure motorbike, there really isn't another choice. And no, the Energica Xperia is a sports tourer, not an adventure bike, despite how often many people compare the two. If you just prefer the look of the bike to the Zero SRF or SRS, and you don't wish to undertake long touring trips, that would be another reason you might opt for it. I opted for the Zero DSR back in 2016, a dual sport bike with knobbly tyres, designed to do some off-road work too, but rode pretty much exclusively on tarmac and certainly didn't do anything more than light gravel tracks. Ultimately I put road tyres on it too. I chose the Zero DSR just because I preferred the look of the bike over the Zero street models at the time. If however like me you like to tour, you want to do so with the fastest possible charge stops and you're riding in areas with plenty of DC rapid charging infrastructure, you would probably be better off going the way I've gone and getting an electric motorbike with DC rapid charging capability. Though zero AC charge rates with a charge tank on board are not too bad. You just pay considerably more to add the charge tank and that still delivers a maximum 12 kilowatts AC compared with Energica's maximum 24 kilowatts DC. To be fair to Zero though, if faster AC charging is more important to you, and it might be, for instance at home, the Zero with its stock 6.6kW onboard charging will charge on a proper EV charge point in around a couple of hours, whereas my Energica is limited to 3kW AC and so takes over twice as long. Horses for courses. Do you know who else the Zero DSRX would suit? Electric adventure riders who decide to ride up a continent with pretty much exclusively AC charging points available. It would be a much more sensible decision than taking a DC charging bike to a place with no DC charging infrastructure and having to spend four times as long charging on AC at every dedicated AC vehicle charge point, even if the manufacturers of the DC charging bike did persuade you by some miraculous means to take their prototype adapted street bike with you. Um, again, I've said too much. Anywho, I hope you've enjoyed my excursion back into Zero territory. As per my introduction, although I've defected to Energica, I remain a fan of Zero motorcycles. 
They now offer quite a range of bikes to suit pretty much any rider and they have many years of experience. I just wish they'd kept their much nicer old logo. Thanks for watching. I don't normally say it because people know the drill, but please consider subscribing if you haven't already done so and giving this video a thumbs up. And I hope you'll join me again soon for another delve into the world of electric motorcycling.